This is Macro Voices, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 416 was produced on February 22, 2024. I'm Eric Townsend. Simplify Asset Management Chief Investment Strategist and Portfolio Manager Mike Green returns as this week's feature interview guest. We'll discuss Jim Bianco's call that inflation may have already bottomed, backwardation in commodities markets, where rates and markets are headed from here, precious metals, and much more. I also have a couple more Substack posts on nuclear energy in the works, so if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to my Substack for free at erictownsend.substack.com. And I'm Patrick Serezna with the Macro Scoreboard week over week as of the close of Wednesday, February 21st, 2024. The S&P 500 futures were down 44 basis points to 49.96, while flat on the week, NVIDIA earnings had the S&P 500 attempting a new breakout. We'll take a closer look at that chart and the key technical levels to watch in the post-game segment. Now, the U.S. dollar index down 69 basis points, trading at 103.99, failed to hold the breakout attempt above 104.50 and is now mean reverting its recent strength. The March WTI crude oil contract up 166 basis points, trading at 77.91, edging toward the January highs. We'll take a closer look at that chart in the post game. The March Arbob gasoline down 172 basis points, trading at 228. The April gold contract up 150 basis points, trading at 2034. The 2000 support offered a bounce, but will the bulls be able to build on it? The copper up 486 basis points to 388, aggressively trading back toward the December and January highs. Uranium down 293 basis points, trading at 99 and a quarter. And the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield up six basis points, trading at 432. The key news to watch next week is the consumer confidence numbers, the uh, preliminary GDP, the core PCE price index, and the ISM manufacturing PMI numbers. This week's feature interview guest is Simplify's chief investment strategist, Mike Green. Eric, why did we get Mike back on the show this week? Well, Patrick, Mike Green is one of our favorite guests. Uh, I always enjoy talking to him. He's an excellent macro strategist. And I don't know how long it's been, but it feels like we're overdue for an update. Well, Eric's interview with Mike Green is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's your host, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Mike Green, Chief Investment Strategist and Portfolio Manager for Simplify Asset Management. Mike, it's great to get you back on the show. It's been too long. I want to start with uh, this whole question of inflation and monetary policy. Jim Bianco really got my attention with a tweet thread he had up last week where he said, hey, I think maybe inflation has already bottomed and is about to start increasing. And of course, the consequence of that could be, or at least I think the consequence of that is just about everybody. And the market is, in my opinion, very complacent in feeling that it's a certainty. You know, we just know now that there's going to be rate cuts. The Fed said there was going to be rate cuts. There have to be rate cuts, especially in an election year. The, the, the whole, you know, 20, 2024 is going to be punctuated by rate cuts. What if the data told the Fed to go the other direction and we had rate hikes between now and the election? Feels to me like nobody's positioned for that. Um, is that a risk? And should we be thinking about that? Well, I think it's always a risk, but I, it's, I, I think it's important for people to recognize that that actually is a priced risk, right? So if I look at the option surface, you know, in the SOFR futures, which would be the way the mechanism that you would typically use for trading those types of expectations, there's about a 15% chance priced in currently that the Fed will actually hike rates at some point this year. Now, that's heavily skewed. Let's just be really clear about that. That's heavily skewed towards rate cuts. But the cone of possibility is there for rate hikes. And, and I'm not 
really sure that I agree with Jim that it is as ignored a prospect as he is indicating. I think there's a general consensus that inflation has retreated and it is likely to head towards the 2% goal that the Fed has articulated. I think there's an awful lot of conviction that there are multiple waves of inflation that will carry through and that that's going to be a much more challenging path. But a lot of the discussion is around is the right answer 3% not so much as the right answer, 9%. So I think 9% would clearly surprise people. I think that's, you know, a return to the high levels that we saw or in a repeat of the 1970s, even higher levels. I think that would be a catastrophe for markets in terms of, of expectations. I just don't share Jim's conviction that that's what's actually happening. I think he's misreading the data. Let's imagine that we had a second hot inflation print in a row. And and to be clear, this last hot inflation print, you know, hot in air quotes there, it wasn't all that hot. It was, you know, 0.1%, uh, you know, above what consensus expectations were. Suppose we had another one like that, just a, you know, a slightly hotter than expected print and the market starts to come around and realize, oh, okay, maybe... Um, Maybe even if we are headed to 2%, it's not going to be a straight line and we're about to see a bounce in inflation here. Does that cause a panic or is that just kind of a shrug it off, not a big deal? Well, I think that it depends on on two separate components. I think that there is a growing element of panic within areas of the market that I think had managed to convince themselves, far more so than market participants, that rate cuts were imminent. I would suggest that those that are in the real estate space, particularly in commercial real estate, are looking at their portfolios and basically begging the Fed to start cutting because they know that they really can't afford these current levels of interest rates. And unlike the corporate sector, those rates are currently in the process of being renegotiated. The lines of credit, the construction loans, the underwritten mortgages, et cetera, on the commercial real estate, those are all coming back up for refinancing. And the really key thing is, is going to be the appraisals against that Uh, Many of the businesses, many of the owners of commercial real estate are going to be forced to come up with actual checks to pay down the loan to value ratios. And they're just not in a position to do that. Now, there's an alternate interpretation of this whole thing, which uh, is not super popular, but I find fascinating just the same, which is some people have said, look, what's really going on is it's not so much that the Fed is reacting to inflation signals the way they say they are. It's more the case that they know that Treasury is going to have to float an incredible amount of you know new uh, T-bill issuance this year because of all of the, uh, the excessive spending and so forth. And the government just can't afford the, these kind of rates. They've got to cut rates, whether it makes monetary policy sense to do so or not. They've got to cut rates in order to essentially you know, give the, the Treasury sweetheart pricing on all of the paper it has to issue. Is there any truth to that? Uh, I, I think that there's unquestionably a dynamic around the increase in supply, putting pressure on rates, and potentially creating conditions under which demand is not met. I think that was a much bigger story in the third quarter of 2023, where what I would describe as sticky portfolio allocations, people unwilling to change their 60-40 allocation to a 50-50 based on the relative attractiveness of equities versus bonds. I think we saw signs that in the fourth quarter of last year, that that began to change in a fairly meaningful way. Many uh, sponsors of corporate pension plans, for example, realized that they had an opportunity to defease their obligations and simply walk away from these components by matching liabilities against the earning assets. That seems to have broken the back a little bit of this. Where are we possibly going to find the demand? And since then, we've had better statistics in terms of auction participation, et cetera, than I think many people had anticipated. I want to move on to the subject of passive investing, something that you've written a tremendous amount about. And I don't just mean the the strategy of passive investing, but its systemic effects and the risks that it creates on markets overall. When you started writing about this, you know, I couldn't help but think to myself, Mike makes really great points, but you know what? The the fund flows just show that, you know, the passive flow is not stopping. It's still coming. It's still coming. It's still coming. Whether it's good or bad, there's just this this ongoing passive inflow into markets. Uh, whatever's driving it, I don't know, but it's driving it. Seems like maybe that's changing. What's going on? 
Well, I think that there's a couple of things that are happening. I mean, one, there's a very influential interview that was done of David Einhorn uh, very recently by Barry Ritholtz on his Masters in Business podcast. I encourage, I know I'm on a competing platform, so I don't want to over-encourage that, but I do think it's actually a very powerful interview that begins to talk through some of the dynamics around how he saw the market change. A lot of people have focused on this idea that he claimed markets are broken without actually understanding what he was highlighting, which is this dynamic of markets are designed to seek out value or attempting to discount the information to place the right price on almost every security so that the returns are largely similar across them. In other words, it's like horse handicapping, right? We're trying to put more weight onto more weight, meaning it's more difficult to outperform to the best companies. Um, and less weight on the other. And he's what he's articulating is this, he's just not seeing a lot of evidence that that's actually happening. I think that's true. And I think that there's a growing awareness that there are distortive impacts of passive. And in particular, the academic literature is beginning to explode around the fact that market cap weighting does not equate to the same thing as liquidity weighting or market impact weighting. And just to emphasize that, if you think about a company like an Apple or a Microsoft, which are currently in the neighborhood of about 7% of the S&P 500, if I think about $1,000 going into an index fund, that implies $70 is going into Apple or Microsoft. On the flip side of that equation, if I think about a small stock within the S&P 500, let's just randomly pick out Delta Airlines, for example, it's going to be like about a penny and a half, maybe 20 cents that's going into Delta Airlines. The distortive impact of that $70 versus the few cents is actually quite significant. And this is highlighted in academic papers by Valentin Haddad or by Xavier Gebay and Ralph Koijin. Um, Ralph Koijin has written other papers on it. The, the underlying dynamic is, is that a more distortive impact is happening at the largest companies. And paradoxically, that means as money flows into passive it's pushing the largest stocks to outperform. David highlighted another metric, another component that I highlight all the time, which is the redemptions that are coming out of the market. The negative flows that are coming out of the market are almost exclusively happening amongst active managers. Those active managers tend to overweight small in value. And what that means is, is that they're painstakingly crafted portfolios of names that they like and love and they think should be worth more are actually being sold out from under them, pushing the pressure down. And that's what David's highlighting when he talks about markets being broken. And I completely agree with his analysis. I know that he was influenced by my analysis, so it's, it's not surprising. But this is very consistent with the data that we're seeing. And I think it's important for people to recognize that the narrative is starting to appreciate this change. If I think about when I started talking about this nearly eight years ago, people would largely dismiss it. They'd say that can't possibly be true. Market cap weighting is the way to go. The awareness that there is distortion occurring is growing and increasingly accepted. Almost everybody I interact with now says, well, yes, I accept that they are influencing the market, but it now becomes a question of the trade-offs. Is it more important that we have a non-distorted market or is it more important that people are able to access low-cost asset management services and unfortunately, I would emphasize that the market is ultimately more important for us. We try to be a capitalist society. A market is about establishing a cost of capital and allocating resources. It's not about guaranteeing a return or offering you low-cost retirement savings. That's not what markets are supposed to do. We're asking them to do too much. And this, by the way, is a quote, you know, uh, Jim Bianco graciously gave me credit for that, but that is an area where Jim and I both agree. Like We're just asking markets to do too much. Well, let's talk about what the specific risks are, because uh, you know we can say it's kind of crazy to have this whole business where the idea is we take your money, you pay us to basically invest your money for you, and then we take great pride in advertising as a feature that we don't think about it before we invest your money. We just, you know, passively invested in the market without thinking. And that's a feature, which uh, which is kind of an interesting thing. But 
what does it mean in terms of, you know, what, what's the mechanism of how this blows up someday? If we get this distorted market, does it eventually correct where everybody realizes, oh my gosh, you know, we, we've overweighted all of these largest cap stocks. They're all overvalued. Small cap is all undervalued. And there's like a crash down and a crash up on the same day or when, what happens? Well, so un- unfortunately, I don't think that all can be used in any of this analysis, right? Not everything is tied to passive. Not all the data that we're seeing is influenced by this. There are fundamental reasons why some companies are outperforming. Clearly, NVIDIA's results have been spectacular. They do deserve for their share price to rise. It just becomes a question of, are we properly pricing that outcome and what are the implications associated with it? I'd also slightly characterize the Vanguard or passive uh, approach slightly differently. It actually reminds me remarkably of the language I heard around Madoff in 2005, 2006, which is this dynamic of wink, wink, nod, nod. We know he's not actually doing split strike options. We assume he's trading ahead of his client. So effectively order, you know, front uh, running the orders that he receives through his trading, uh, through his brokerage firm. I think there's something very similar in the passive dynamic, right? Wink, wink, nod, nod. Why pay for the services of active management or why really try to beat when you can be a free rider on the system and outperform because you're paying less than everybody else, right? It's a very much kind of insider. This is what all the smart people would do. Don't be one of those rubes who gets caught up in the dynamics of trying to outperform for active management. I've started trying to frame it for people in the context of a web 2.0 language we use. If you're not doing the work and you're not paying for the product, you are the product. What they want is your assets and they're marketing to you. And, you know, there's an interview that I did of Bob Pisani where he uh, waxes philosophically about how wonderful John Bogle sounded and how he sounded like John Bogle and how he gave him information about things. And I just sat there going, Bob, you do understand he was selling you. And, and he was horrified. He's like, how could you say that about John Bogle? Right? How could you say he was marketing to me? But that's what he was doing. He was selling Bob and he was a master marketer. I want to come back to something you said earlier about commercial real estate and its vulnerability to uh, to rates, and especially if rates were to hike as opposed to cut from here. Um, you know, I, I hear that the risk in commercial real estate, which seems pretty darn significant to me, is contained. And any time I hear the word contained, I think back to Ben Bernanke uh, telling us that subprime was contained. Um, is commercial real estate risk a systemic risk that we should be more concerned about than people are? And are there other risks that are supposedly contained where contained is in air quotes and doesn't really mean what it sounds like? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really challenging one, right? So so the whole subprime is contained. Remember that the housing market broke in 2006. It really started to crack in 2005 with the spike in gasoline prices that made it unsustainable for people to drive an hour and a half to work each way. They effectively discovered they were paying far more for an exurban home in total costs than they were for something closer to their work. That led to the abandonment of the wholesale buying of low value exurban type properties and started the collapse in the housing market. It was March 2007, right? So almost 18 months after that point that Ben Bernanke announced the subprime was contained. And in fact, we had had interest rates, the Fed funds rate, the last hike was in May 2006. So we were a solid, you know, give or take 10 months into the pause process before Ben Bernanke actually said that. Uh, Within a few months after that statement, by August of 2007, we began to see the dynamics of what was initially referred to as the quant quake, where we discovered the positions were over levered and too crowded. And the markets began to vacillate. The Fed began cutting interest rates and found itself cutting all the way through 2009. I I can't possibly know that this is going to be identical, but it does feel from the language that's out there that CRE is contained, commercial real estate is contained. Uh, The Bank of England has now come out and said, we think 70% of the impacts of the hikes are already through the system. I, I just think there's no way you could possibly say that because we haven't actually seen the refinancings. We haven't seen the transactions We effectively have been doing the opposite, or not quite the opposite, of extend and pretend, which was the language from early 2009, 
which was basically let's not make things do. This time around, you have yeah, I, I, I can't be catchy and think of it, but it's effectively something like avoid and pray, right? Let's not refinance. Let's push ourselves to the absolute end to see if we can get some optionality here. And maybe if we're lucky, other people will start to fail first and the Fed will be forced to cut rates, giving us some protection. That's kind of what I think is happening, what we're seeing. We see this in high yield. We see it in commercial real estate. I would argue that it's a critical component of Americans' unwillingness to shed their 2.75% mortgages. They know they can't really afford their existing home at a 6 7%, 8% mortgage in some situations. So they're doing everything they can to avoid triggering that dynamic. The hard part with recessions is, is that they force those, chase, those choices forward. You lose your job, suddenly it really doesn't matter what the interest rate on your home is. You might be forced to sell it. You need to relocate for work. You might be forced to sell that house. The supply in turn begins to increase. I think we're early in that process, but we are at that point where, believe it or not, as much as everybody wants to argue in the opposite direction, unemployment is starting to tick up. We are beginning to see the more vulnerable elements of society, particularly those at the lower end, begin to experience the classic cyclical rising of unemployment that I think people are just desperately trying to say it doesn't exist out there. But it, but it clearly does. I think the other component that's really interesting in this is what you have to watch for is beginning to change in a very meaningful way. The level of unemployment compensation is so low and so intrusive in many regions around the country. California would be a great example. Florida would be another one where the level of compensation is so low that people aren't even bothering to file for unemployment. Instead, they're saying, I've got a car. I've got to pay way too much for the payment on this car. I might as well use it to drive for Uber. And so if you look at the last two earnings reports from Uber and Lyft, they both are using the same language. Driver availability is increasing. You can interpret that as a very positive metric if you're an Uber investor. But if you're a macro investor and looking at the status of the U.S. economy, you have to acknowledge that full-time employment is falling, that people are increasingly forced to seek out that second job to allow them to make ends meet. And something like an Uber or a Lyft is a fantastic resource for a limited number of people, right? The system can absorb X increase in people before it in turn begins to impact the incomes associated with all the other Uber drivers. And then you go a step further and recognize that if unemployment rises enough, demand for Uber starts to fall, even as the supply begins to rise. And that system really can't function as the unemployment insurance. But it's doing a great job right now of concealing a lot of those dynamics. Let's talk about commodities in general. A lot of people have said, okay, uh, new commodity super cycle, it's all bullish from here. But at the same time, you know, we, we are looking at least for now at contracting inflation. Where do you see commodities headed? And uh, particularly with respect to the, the changes now that we're starting to see structural backwardation in a lot of commodities, you're getting a positive carry that makes them more attractive. How do you see the commodity markets in general evolving from here? Well, I think you just hit on the really critical point, right? So where I disagree with a lot of people in the commodity space is I'm not at all convinced that we have a big bull market of commodity investing ahead of us where spot prices rise significantly. In general, that tends to be associated with a significant fall in the U.S. dollar. I know that there are people out there that think that that's imminent. The challenge, of course, is if everything we talked about, that the theoretically the Fed could delay cutting rates if I look around the rest of the world, it seems that the odds are, are higher that the rest of the world would want to cut rates before the U.S., all else being equal. New Zealand is an interesting one because they've gone the opposite direction. Um, and we can talk about that if you want. But I don't think that we ultimately want to rely on New Zealand as the guide for monetary policy for the entire world. But there is actually a really significant change that has happened that I think makes commodity investing interesting regardless of your belief of the change in spot prices. And this is a substantive change, right? So I wrote about this this past week in my Substack. And if you go back and you look at 2004, 2005, there was an academic paper written by Gary Gordon, currently at Yale University, called Facts and Fantasies of Commodity Futures. 
that white paper kicked off a boom in ETFs and investing in commodities in the institutional space that in many ways is not dissimilar to what we're seeing in private credit or private equity today or even Bitcoin, to be quite candid. The flow of funds into the commodity space changed the forward curve. So we actually suddenly went from markets where you could buy commodities with a lower price into the future and carry positively as you move towards spot, what has traditionally been called the convenience yield associated with commodities. That was by and large responsible for the vast majority of returns associated with commodity investing alongside the levels of higher rates themselves. Because again, remember with a commodity and a commodity future, you're not actually paying cash. You're typically collateralizing it against treasuries. So you have a combination of the treasury yield and the carry associated with it. That now looks really attractive. We're actually at a point where that backwardation in many markets is significantly better. The carry yield over the next year is more attractive than it was prior to 2005. That means it's possible to invest in commodities and make money without having prices, spot prices, move to an extraordinary degree. And I know that's nowhere near as sexy and exciting as a spot price move that takes copper to $27 a pound. But the simple reality is, is that's historically been the real source of returns associated with commodities. And I think that opportunity is wide open again. On the flip side of that, I think that, you know, this general fear that we're in a, you know, another commodity cycle is just increasingly being disproven. The supply response that came out, even at modestly higher levels of oil prices in the United States, and the requirements from Saudi Arabia to cut production and things like oil are actually, you know, evidence that the demand side of the equation is not nearly as strong as people thought it was. Unfortunately, um, Pierre Andoran saw that in spades in, in 2023. If I look, at, you know, a step further, actually, and, and ask, you know, what are the implications of this? Ironically, it actually feeds back into the inflation discussion that we had at the start and not in a way that a lot of people appreciate. The way the BLS calculates rent and the rental component of the CPI is they actually note that a portion of most rents is the utilities that are included, right? So often if you rent an apartment, it will include things like heat. Well, that's paid for by natural gas. And so when natural gas prices fall, that's actually treated by the BLS as an energy services component, a utility component of housing and stripped out. So when natural gas falls as aggressively as it has, perversely, that means that even if the rent didn't change, because you're paying less or you're receiving less value for the embedded included utilities, that shows up as a fairly significant increase in rents. It sounds crazy. I understand that. But that's actually how it's calculated. And if you then go a step further and you look at something like core CPI, when you do core, you're stripping out all those energy services and you're concentrating it in the remaining components. What I actually think has happened is, is that bounce in owner's equivalent rent that Jim and others are pointing to and saying, oh my gosh, it's the return of inflation monster. Ironically, I think that's actually prices falling in the energy sector that's really driving that dynamic. Let's talk about gold specifically. When the Fed pivoted and said, okay, we're, you know, the dot plot came out and said there's going to be rate cuts in 2024. Something I noticed was quite a few people, you know, the blogs and so forth on the internet were kind of saying, okay, the new narrative is there's for sure the, the cuts are coming. This has to be the year that gold breaks out through its new all time highs. And when it does, that means if you, just extend the, the target on the cup and handle pattern. You know, you're looking at 2700, 2750, uh, just around the corner. It's a, you, you can't lose. It's time to lever up gold because you know it's coming for sure. Anytime anybody talks about anything coming for sure, I get really nervous about things going the opposite direction. What could go wrong here for gold? Um, well, I think there's a couple of things that you, know, you highlighted. One is obviously a repeat of the dynamics from 2008, which is that it actually turns out the credit spreads widen dramatically. Gold is a funded entity, as we were just talking about with futures. You know, it's always a question of, can I provide the capital to hold the position? 
you know, that can sell off. I do think that gold is interesting. I think there's a couple of things that are probably going on there. One is obviously Bitcoin is now competing with gold under the rubric of digital gold. I think there's some evidence that that competition has lowered the value of the responsiveness of gold. And we'll see if that ends up playing out in this cycle that creates some risk. The bigger one that I'm more focused on is actually the deflationary pulse, the risk that we're looking at a credit event. And that unfortunately is consistent with what we're seeing in the dynamics we were talking about before of kind of this, uh, you know, avoid and pray type dynamic we're seeing in the credit markets. Mike, let's come back to inflation and go into a little bit more detail. You know, not many people really pay attention to the difference between headline and core inflation and, and things that are adjusted out and so forth. Give us a little perspective on the difference between inflation indicators. You mentioned trueflation earlier, how that compares or differs from the BLS data and what investors need to know about that. Yeah, I think I think that's actually a really interesting one. Um, and I would encourage people to check out the trueflation website. I have no affiliation with them other than being friendly with the, the founders and occasionally offering them my thoughts and, and perspective on things. If you look at their website and you look at their CPI dashboard, you'll see this pause in progress towards disinflation. Housing was a big component of that. And I think that there is, of course, a very broad recognition that the housing markets are stronger than people had anticipated. But that consolidation, which could have led to a discussion around is inflation rebounding, has now definitively resolved itself lower. I think that that is actually, unfortunately, the direction that we're going to see ourselves going and the Fed choosing to pause and wait is creating conditions, I think, that actually reinforce that. The dynamic that I was highlighting with Trueflation is twofold. One is, first, they're much closer to the PCE metric than the CPI metric. So that largely involves a lower weight to the housing component than you have in the CPI. In the CPI, it's about 40% of total CPI. It's about 38%, I think it is, uh, versus only about 25% in PCE. If I go to something like core CPI, remember what I'm doing in core CPI is I'm stripping out many of the things like gasoline prices, et cetera, that make somewhere up around 15% of the basket and further concentrating it into that housing sector. So I've got this you know, giant housing number that is being created ironically by falling prices in natural gas or the utility component that perversely is leading to these this data that says oh my gosh prices are exploding again to the top side i just don't think there's any evidence for that and if we look at the private sector components which again trueflation is really relying on they're using data that's coming from various published sources on the internet or elsewhere we are seeing data that is much lower than what the Fed is is arguing. Now, some, again, people argue single family versus multifamily. Is there a worse trend in multifamily than single family? Absolutely. That's absolutely true. Um, but the single family itself is not running at the six type percent that we're talking about. Even the most ardent proponents of higher expected inflation would point to single family being more like three to 4%, which is roughly in line actually with what the housing sector was producing prior to the 2020 cycle. The last thing that I would just say about the trueflation type dynamics is they are not trying to hedonically adjust. They are trying to capture things like shrinkflation. They may not do it perfectly, but they seem to do a pretty good job from what I'm seeing and from what I understand of their methodology. And so it's, I think it's very frustrating for people to hear the language that inflation is retreating even as they're looking at their grocery bill that is significantly higher than it was three years ago or their car insurance that is significantly higher than it was three years ago. And unfortunately, that's just a misunderstanding of inflation. Inflation is not the price level. It's the change in the price level. And so most of those prices are not going up anymore or not going up at an accelerated rate. There are isolated incidences, right? I just have to emphasize like car insurance. Absolutely, it's going up. Why? Because when the cost of a new car has risen, when that price level has risen, when the insurance company is confronted with the need to replace your car if you're in an accident, and remember the frequency of accidents doesn't change because of the price level, right? People are just as stupid 
with $50,000 cars as they are with $35,000 cars in terms of their driving habits. Uh, so you crash the car, you need to replace it. Guess what? The insurance is going to have to pay out more money and they are in turn going to charge you for that. This is exacerbated by the dynamics of consolidation and pricing power that has occurred. Many states are now confronting the reality that they have very few participants in their insurance market, whether that's tied to autos or to homes. We just don't have truly competitive markets in many areas, and that's contributing to it, but that's a historical data point. Unless you think that new prices for cars or prices for used cars are going to accelerate again this year, and the evidence is actually it's going the opposite direction, then you should expect very little increase in insurance costs for 2024. And my guess is that's what we're ultimately going to see, that a lot of the short-term stuff we're seeing turns into be a little bit of a tempest in a teapot. I want to come back to something you said a few minutes ago. You talked about how we had this debate, if you will, in, in markets about, okay, you know, it looks like inflation maybe is starting to run away. No, 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 it's going to retrace. It's going to move back to the downside. And as you said, the consensus eventually came around to, okay, now inflation's going to start trending back down towards 2%. And that's what we've been seeing. But hang on a second, Mike, that whole debate happened before the last, I've lost count, how many wars have broken out now in the last six months? Um, I've lost count. Wars are always inflationary. And frankly, the way I'm interpreting the trend, uh, I think that we're headed toward a continuing escalation that maybe, I don't want to say goes, I don't want to use the phrase hot war with Russia in the sense that it implies, you know, ballistic missiles flying. But I think that direct or more direct conflict with Russia, I see the Ukraine conflict is entirely a U.S.-Russia proxy war, but I, I think it gets less proxy and more war over time. Um, that means potentially if we see more of shipping being impacted, if we see more losses uh, occurring as a result of military interdictions, if we see uh, increasing, as you just said, in the case of automobiles, if we see higher freight insurance rates because there's a higher risk of your container ship being blown up in the Red Sea or something. Something. Um, isn't that all inflationary? And if you're going to have a, a big war trend, doesn't it imply a, a longer term inflation trend? Well, again, I think it's important that people define what they mean by inflation. And so ironically, like it's very frustrating because inflation feels like it should be the most straightforward thing in the world. I walk into a store, I have $100 in my wallet, I walk out with less than I did last year, right? That's what inflation feels like it should be. And so an increase in shipping costs does seem like that should be inflationary. That can be passed through. It doesn't have to be passed through. And in part, when you talk about increasing prices into an environment of relative weakness, it becomes a question of how much can get captured. In competitive markets, those types of cost increases, at least a fraction of it is going to be captured as a surplus that is actually received by the consumer relative to the producer. The producer wants to bring the product to market. They have to transport it from their factory or their production facility. And the consumer really doesn't care. The consumer is ambivalent between a car that is sourced or somewhat ambivalent between a car, or let's use a TV because that's easier, a TV that is sourced from Japan versus a TV that is sourced from, and I'm going to choose something completely absurd, Saudi Arabia. Right. If the cost to, in, to, to ship TVs from Saudi Arabia rises or through the Suez Canal, basically China to Europe, you'll see less of it and you'll see more that transits to the United States. And so perversely, a lot of the disruptions that we're talking about adversely affect the ability for Europe to consume and for Europe to sell to China. In many ways, that's actually a net positive for the United States whose shipping lines largely remain open. We're not seeing the type of disruptions in our ports that we saw in 2021 and 2022. Yes, there are some cost increases. It's unclear how much of that will be absorbed by the public showing up as higher prices and how much of that will be absorbed by the corporate sector showing up as lower margins. Okay, but a lot of people, including some U.S. military commanders, have warned that where this is all headed is not just a conflict with Russia, but eventually a, a growing escalation of conflict between the United States and China. Do you get to the point where at some point, you know, th there are major uh, 
restrictions on trade and how do we resolve the many dependencies that we have where we're frankly sole source for a lot of products, including pharmaceuticals from, from China. You know, we, we, we can't live without them, but we're maybe about to go to war with them. That doesn't seem like a good recipe. Yeah, I mean, this is unfortunately the byproduct of an interconnected world. I, I'm not sure that I would put the emphasis on the U.S. and I might lean the emphasis more towards China. The simple reality is that China needs its customers around the world to absorb its production. If we choose to stop trading with China, absolutely prices will increase for all sorts of goods that we ter- currently take for granted. Husband your umbrellas and baseball caps very carefully. Right, recognize that a lot of the things that we think of, and we only have to go back to 2020 and look at things like PPE, if you are dependent on China for it, the risk of that supply being disrupted is meaningful. But even more important is China relies on us so that we can absorb their productive capacity. And this is increasingly true for Europe. It's part of what's contributing to the rising tensions and awareness that China is not actually going to be allowed to grow in the manner that it has. And I would argue that China has made a number of missteps in terms of its attempts to move up the value chain uh, as it effectively confronts fewer labor resources with a shrinking pool of workers. They're trying to increase their value add so that they can ultimately raise incomes associated with that. That means they're running headlong into the dynamics of the European auto industry they're out competing with better products at lower prices, but that's exactly what the Japanese did in the late 1980s that ultimately flipped the script on Japan and caused the rest of the world to wake up and say, no, we're not taking all this, right? You have to invest in our countries. You have to provide us with resources. We're not just going to allow this to be a one-way move. And China is resisting that. And I can understand that. Like nobody wants to be told well, the customer's right, you're wrong. But those are simply the realities of business. Mike, let's talk about where the escalation could come from from here. And, you know, I'll just be honest. Uh, I think an important skill of investors is to recognize your own weaknesses. One of my weaknesses is I've become very cynical about this. I'm I'm very frustrated with how easily uh, our government seems to be willing to just start new wars or enter new wars. Uh, And frankly, my, my personal frustration with policy matters is probably skewing my judgment. So how do you see the risk? of further escalation. I'm very concerned about it. Uh, What do you think the next five years bring to the world in terms of geopolitical escalations? Where do the risks lie? And what are the uh, both geopolitical and market implications of those escalations if they do occur? So I, I, I think it really is an important question. And it's one that unfortunately, I have a personally vested interest in my son is actually in the military. And, uh, you know, the last thing I want is to see uh, proxy wars turn into outright wars. I do think that, you know, you and I have talked about this. I was one of the early people to say, we've probably started World War III. It definitely feels a lot more like that today than it did two years ago when I started putting that bug in your ear. And I think as people become more aware of it, ironically, it actually has the potential to both increase the probability of the event and at the same time, lower the probability of the event. I think we're moving into a very bimodal world where one of two things is going to happen. Either that escalation occurs and we basically decide, all right, let's have it out. Right. And in that situation, you are absolutely correct. Shipping lanes are going to be disrupted. The ability to sell stuff around the world and to trade and take advantage of the benefits associated with that will experience at least a period of disruption. At the same time, it also seems highly likely that that type of war is, or a modern type of war is going to be very different than the B-52s flying into Europe or into Japan, where you have tons and tons of metal and equipment and tanks and everything else, right? We seem to be seeing, and I think this is fairly straightforward, an incredible growth in the use of precision munitions and the use of drones, which require far less material to carry out their destructive mission. That doesn't mean fewer people die. Hopefully it means fewer civilians relative to combatants die. That is always kind of an objective. It's something you should be aiming for. But it does suggest that the material intensity 
of this type of war is actually going to be quite different than what we've seen so far. Eventually, you get down to the point where you have to say, OK, you know, fix bayonets and let's actually go in and start stabbing each other if you get close enough for that. But that's pretty far down the line, right? There's a lot of proxies. There's a lot of precision munitions that get used. And to your point, the U.S. government does seem very happy to engage in military conflict. But part of the reason why is because it's actually fallen in price so far that in many ways it's actually to our interest to conduct policy on other people's shores versus in the United States. I don't like that. I don't think it's a good policy per se, but I understand why it's happening. And I think, you know, Pippa, Mongren, and others will talk about this as well. This feels like it's going to be a very different type of war, focused much more on domestic disturbance, focused much more on things like drones, precision munitions. And in all likelihood, there's a reasonable chance that most Americans somewhat similar to where we are today, don't actually even realize that we're conducting operations that look an awful lot like full-scale war. Well, Mike, I can't thank you enough for another terrific interview. Uh, As our listeners know, I always give our guests a minute to plug their services at the end. In your case, I'm going to be a little more specific and ask you to go into some specific detail into which of the ETFs you guys manage relate to or support some of the specific investing themes that we discussed in today's interview, particularly something that used to be the case in markets was if you were smart enough to understand the way commodities work, as you said, the carry as opposed to a change in the spot price is where you tend to make most of the returns. Few people understood that, and you really had to be an accredited investor who was qualified to invest with a commodity trading advisor to get somebody to run your money for you who knew how to do that. Now, you could do it yourself if you knew which commodities were in backwardation and you're switching from one ETF to the next, but getting somebody who knows how this works to figure out which which commodities are offering the most backwardation and therefore the most roll carry. There didn't used to be any way for retail investors to access those kind of strategies. Do any of your ETFs uh, do that kind of stuff? And if so, which ones? Yeah, so we actually introduced two products in the trend following space. The first has the ticker CTA as in Commodity Trading Advisor. That is a broad trend following strategy that incorporates elements of both spot price change for trend as well as mean reversion in terms of extension or overvaluation. And then really importantly, has a large element of carry, recognizing that that has been the historical components of return. Uh, We saw this change in terms of the dynamics of the, the move towards backwardation. We recognize that even if we disagreed on the potential for a large commodity cycle, that the opportunity was emerging for vehicles to invest in these products because of the things like the reemergence of positive carry characteristics, as well as the positive carry characteristics associated with the collateral that you're holding. The bonds now actually offer a reasonable yield as well. So the two products that we have in that space are CTA, which is broadly across both financial instruments and commodities, and then hard which is for the hard assets, strictly focused on the commodity components of that. Both of those products are done in concert with my good friend, Charlie McGarrah, who I believe you've interacted with in the past. Charlie used to run the metals desk at Goldman Sachs. Um, His firm, Altus, has a long history in terms of uh, managing trend following strategies, and it's incorporated a lot of the insights that Charlie brings from his time trading commodities into how those products are designed. Again, emphasizing things like carry uh, so that you're not fully trapped in terms of a spot price appreciation model. On the credit cycle side, if you are concerned about an increase in the credit spreads or the risks in the high yield space, uh, there we have a product called CDX, which is ultimately focused around a high yield exposure with a credit hedge overlay. That credit hedge overlay is unique within the world of either mutual funds or ETFs. We have both an equity long short overlay that does a phenomenal job of mimicking credit spreads in its behavior. In other words, it outperforms when credit spreads are widening. It underperforms in a somewhat asymmetric manner when credit spreads are tightening. And all we're doing there is just that we are creating a long short overlay that is tied effectively to this refinancing feature that we were talking about before, 
where long companies that never need to tap capital markets and in many situations are returning capital, again, similar to that discussion that David Einhorn had earlier uh, last week, and we're short companies that need to refinance. And so it gives us a, a behavior that's almost identical to credit spreads. That's one mechanism that we're using for protection. We also have in that product the ability to do the full hedge fund suite of using things like credit default swaps. So we remove any risk of basis uh, differential in terms of the performance of that hedge, or at least a portion of that. That product is currently positioned for a widening of credit spreads. But if credit spreads don't widen, if I'm wrong on that analysis, you still have the core exposure to the high yield market that should allow you to deliver a better than risk-free return profile. And ultimately, even though we've seen credit spreads tighten over the past couple of years, that product has been able to keep pace with its benchmark actually slightly outperforming it. Listeners, Mike mentioned an interview between David Einhorn and Barry Ritholtz. We'll have that linked in your research roundup email. Patrick Ceresna, Nick Glarnick, and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. This is Macro Voices, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to have Mike Green back on the show. Now joining us again in the post-game segment is Nick Galarnik. Now let's get to that chart deck. Listeners, you're going to find a download link for the post-game chart deck in your research roundup email. If you don't have a research roundup email, it means you have not yet registered at macrovoices.com. Just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com, and click on the button over Mike Green's picture saying, looking for the downloads. Now, Eric, let's cover crude oil. EIA inventory data was delayed by the holiday week, so I don't have that, although API data suggested that there's been another large build offset by large product drawdowns. Looking at the price chart, it seems kind of unremarkable at first glance. The markets tried but failed to get over 78.50 several times now, and looking at the price chart alone, the market looks kind of fatigued with not much hope for that rally to continue. But the term structure chart tells a radically different story, with front of curve time spreads blowing out to steep backwardation. There's almost certainly a fundamental driver for that backwardation, but I have to admit I'm not sure what it is. I've been focused on other things this week. The steep backwardation at the front of the curve is often a leading indicator of higher flat prices to come, but that signal is usually only a day or so ahead of the flat price move. The sharp rally in front of curve time spreads has been going on for over a week now with little follow-through on the flat price chart, and frankly, I'm not sure what to make of that. Eric, as oil trades toward that 78.50, I mean, you were talking about it failing to break out, but it also isn't breaking down off that. So many times that resistance level is tested until it's broken. Uh, right now, uh, we've seen for the last month, or actually last two months, the sequence of higher highs and higher lows and general accumulation sitting above its moving averages. I think it's prudent to give the bulls the benefit of the doubt that they'll be able to still break that 78.50 level. Uh, if it does, uh, I think a very reasonable target is the mid 80s where the Fibonacci zones lie and uh, the entire oil complex is quite oversold. So anticipating some sort of a, a mean reverting rally, I think it's a very realistic case to, to be looking for. Nonetheless, uh, I want to move on to equities. Uh, what are your thoughts here, Eric? I think the market's in a tug of war between two narratives. The first narrative says this market looks awfully toppy, with huge breadth divergences and just a handful of stocks carrying the indices higher despite lackluster performance of the broader market. All of that is very bearish. On the other side of the tug of war is the narrative that, hey, it's an election year, the fix is in, and the Fed has already indicated their intentions to begin cutting rates soon, which everyone assumes is certain to take markets even higher. 
Wednesday's FOMC minutes revealed that the FOMC members are more worried about cutting too soon than cutting too late. To my thinking, that also implies that if the data change and inflation really has bottomed, as Jim Bianco has suggested it may have, then it's still possible we get no cuts at all this year, or maybe even a rate hike before the election. Now, I'm not saying that will happen. In fact, I still think it's unlikely. I am saying it's possible, and I think a lot of people are assuming it's not possible. So if it did happen, I think the market would be caught off guard and panic very quickly, as almost nobody is hedged for that outcome. So I think the March 12th CPI report is going to be far more important than most CPI reports. A miss on inflation expectations would cement in place the complacency we already have that rate cuts are just around the corner and the market is sure to rally through the summer into the election. But a second hot CPI print in a row, coupled with this week's FOMC minutes indicating the FOMC may be less dovish than previously thought, could be the catalyst to knock this entire house of cards down. So I'll have my eyes glued to my screens at 8.30 in the morning on Tuesday, March 12th, when the next BLS CPI report is released. All right. Well, I want to get Nick involved in this conversation. Nick, let's just first start off with talking the levels on the S&P 500. Yeah, Patrick. So right now, the spot price on SPX is approximately 49.80. We have a call wall above at 5,100 and a put wall far below at 4,500. The implied move for the March 15th monthly OPEX is plus minus 120 points. Therefore, the upper implied move is 5,100 right at that call wall. And the lower implied move is 4,860. Right now, we have key resistance at all-time highs of 50.50 and key support at 4,900. I'm thinking that we're going to see a push toward that 5,100 mark on the back of NVIDIA's strong report. But I do think we see a window of weakness into the March OPEX down toward 4,800 perhaps. Uh, what the cause is, I don't really know. But again, I, I think we've ran too far too fast. And I think that a pullback is in order. I generally agree with you. I mean, the it was always going to be about this FOMC meeting minutes and the and the Nvidia earnings. And right now, the market is interpreting it bullishly. Uh, there are measured moves up to that fifty one hundred to fifty one fifty area. So the this uh, could spur a very short term bull impulse to the very levels you were just identifying. Uh, and uh, overall, the market is just overextended. And so it's going to the one thing that I uh, watch quite a bit on is on page five here, Nick, we have the uh, percentage of stocks on the New York Stock Exchange trading above their 50-day moving average just to get a gauge on the market breadth. And what we continue to see is that this really is a rally, just being driven just by those the few number of stocks of Amazon, Meta, and now NVIDIA that are pushing this index higher. But that we haven't seen the breadth widen on here, which basically means that these major MAG7 stocks have to do all of the work uh, to keep pushing this higher. And that in itself, I think, will lead to that exhaustion point that you were referencing. At some stage, we're going to see a correction. But right now, uh, with this type of a breakout here, we're going to certainly uh, give the bulls the benefit of the doubt to see uh, whether or not they can uh, make that higher high uh, in the coming day. Now, Nick, let's move on to the NASDAQ. What uh, levels are you watching on the Qs? So spot price right now on Qs is approximately 432. We have a call wall above at 440. And we have a put wall below at 410, which are previous all-time highs. The implied move for the March 15th monthly OPEX is plus minus 16 points. Therefore, the upper implied move is 448, and the lower implied move is 416. Again, as I said with SPX, I'm inclined to think we see a push toward that high, perhaps touch 445, 450, before seeing a pullback down to the area of 415, 410 perhaps, uh, which are the previous all-time highs. Um, I think we've gone too far too fast. And what I'm seeing too is, as you alluded to earlier, the MAG7 is actually kind of weakening overall because a few of the names are lagging. So Apple and Tesla, for example, are not really participating too much in this overall rally. Uh, as you said, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, Meta, and NVIDIA are primarily driving this rally higher. So even less breadth than we've seen before in the MAG7, um, I don't think it's sustainable at all whatsoever. 
This interesting observation is that the S&P 500 looks like it's about to make a higher high before the NASDAQ is. And uh, that actually shows that actually uh, when you leave these three to four stocks that are doing all of the work, uh, the breadth uh, actually in the NASDAQ is deteriorating. I mean, there are only 45% of stocks on the NASDAQ are actually above their 50-day moving averages. The breadth is far worse than it is on the broader markets. And so what you have is a few of these mega cap names that are doing all of the work work there and even uh, more distinct deterioration in the prices below. And you can see that the NASDAQ itself is not in the same position to make the higher high as quick as the S&P is. And it would be interesting to see if that starts to converge or, or further diverges from each other. Nick, I want to move on though to the volatility index. Uh, well, we obviously have uh, over the last week been trading at higher levels. Uh, we were obviously for two months, three months almost trading in that 12 to 14 level on the VIX. And now we've seen a sustained level above 14. Uh, and so obviously vol premiums are rising. What's your take on the VIX here? Yeah, so with the VIX at around 14, 15 area, you can expect to see top to bottom moves intraday of about 0.75 to 0.8%. Yesterday, for instance, the implied move was 0.68% on SPX. We saw a realized move of 0.75%. And that happened in the last half hour of the day. So again, what we're seeing here is a lot of this option selling, put selling on pullbacks, which is kind of dampening the decline overall. On the flip side, we're seeing almost no call selling now. Uh, yesterday, for example, we saw you know a huge gamma wrap into close where we pushed from 49.50 all the way to 49.80 in the last half hour. And so it's possible that as we get higher toward the uh, 5100 area, we see a lot more call selling pickup, which dampens volatility again and kind of gets us stuck in the mud perhaps in between 5000 and 5100. Anyways, moving on to page eight, we have the US dollar index here. Eric, what are your thoughts? Well, last week I said that if we could get the Dixie back under 104, there was still a chance that the apparent breakout above 104 and a half was just a knee-jerk reaction to the hot CPI print, soon to be faded. Well, that's exactly what's happened, but so far we're only just barely below 104, and it's not like the dollar's crashing or anything like that. In fact, at 103 spot 75 as I record this, we're hanging right on channel support, so an upside reversal off that trend line is entirely possible right here. But if we can stay under 104, the weakening dollar trend thesis may still have legs. But as I said earlier, I'm going to be glued to my screens on March 12th when the next CPI data release hits the tape. That's when we could see a sudden upset in the dollar trend. Well, during this consolidation, Eric, the interesting thing is, is that uh, the yen, the US dollar yen has really actually continued to hold up. I mean, this was a reaction on that uh, euro, uh, which popped towards 109. So we find ourselves in a situation where uh, really uh, this euro driven dollar consolidation is now actually coming to a key level on the euro. And so for me, uh, actually watching whether the 109 acts as a resistance on the euro USD is going to be critical. Uh, this could uh, quickly find the US dollar back to 104, 104 and a half if this was simply just a, a short term retracement in that currency. And moving on to page nine, we have the gold futures chart. What are your thoughts here? I'm getting increasingly concerned that too many traders, myself included, levered up our gold positions thinking that the Fed's dovish tilt was certain to mean that 2024 would be the year of the breakout to new all-time highs. Now, I still hold the view that higher gold prices are coming sooner or later. And like everyone else, I'm eyeing a sustained breakout over 2087 as a signal that would greenlight an intermediate-term cup-and-handle target of 2070. But a second hot CPI print in a row and a sudden change of market sentiment could easily spell a deeper correction down to 1922 or even lower before the bullish long-term fundamentals kick back in. So I'm pretty sure that I'm either going to de-risk or hedge my large long position in gold futures before the March 12th CPI release. Again, I'm still super bullish long term. I just see a very clear setup now for the market to be caught off guard if another hot CPI print spoils the party. And if that happens, it will set up a beautiful buy the deeper dip opportunity around 1922. 
and I want to have plenty of dry powder ready to seize that opportunity if it happens. We're bouncing nicely off the hot CPI print knee-jerk swing low, and the slow stochastics are only a little past halfway back up, so the current rally probably has a few more days in it before the next swing high, when I'm going to think seriously about de-risking or hedging, at least through March 12th. Well, with that U.S. dollar weakness, we uh, certainly have a little bit of a risk on, and gold was quite oversold at a major 2,000 round number support line. We saw that reaction, but I'm not going to get excited about gold until we see legitimate price action north of 2,050. If we see that this just fades off of this little rally and is find ourselves back at 2,000 in a week, uh, then it just continues to suggest that gold is being distributed. Uh, overall, I think there's a big gold move coming this year, but uh, I don't trust this initial rally here yet. I want to see whether or not uh, the bulls actually follow through on these little bumps or whether or not this is quickly faded. And uh, it's just too early to tell. Now, Eric, you mentioned you had some thoughts on uranium. I'm interested in hearing what you have to say about this. The uranium and uranium mining markets have clearly entered a downside correction, which makes perfect sense in the wake of excessive exuberance putting upside gaps on most uranium stock charts after the spot uranium price broke the $100 round number psychological barrier. We've now taken out the 50-day moving averages decisively to the downside, and most uranium shares and ETFs are approaching or have already tested their 100-day moving averages on Wednesday. If those targets don't hold, the next target lower is the 200-day moving averages. I've already bought the test of the 100-day moving averages in several issues, and I'll add even larger size if we're lucky enough to get a deeper correction all the way down to the 200-day moving averages. While we're on the subject of nuclear energy, I want to put a challenge out to some of our smartest institutional investors. Harley Bassman, if you're listening, this is right up your alley. I would really love to way to figure out how to fade the utterly nonsensical view that commercial fusion energy is about to become reality at grid scale in the next few years. But I can't figure out what the trade is in public markets. Now, I don't want to short the fusion companies. Fusion is way cool stuff, and it will eventually be profoundly important to the future of energy. Now, that's unlikely to happen in my lifetime, but it will eventually happen, so shorting the companies that are doing the long-term research doesn't really make sense. But even really smart people like Saxo Bank's Steen Jakobsen are talking publicly about claims now being made that the UK will have grid-scale fusion energy pumped into its electric grids by 2030 at the latest. Look, folks, that's not just optimistic or unrealistic. That's plain freaking retarded. I would absolutely love to find a leveraged bet that that's not going to happen using publicly traded financial instruments. So if there are any companies out there that are betting the farm on grid scale commercial fusion energy becoming reality, not just someday, but in the next 10 years, meaning they fail and go bankrupt if it doesn't happen in that time frame, those are the companies I want to short in massive size. So if anyone can think of a pure play on how to make that bet in the markets, I'd love to hear from you via email to info at macrovoices.com. And if anybody wants more color on why these delusional fantasies will never happen in that time frame, the first post at erictownsend.substack.com gives more insight into why these claims about nuclear fusion energy are nonsensical at best. Now, Eric, on page 10, I have that 50-day moving average on the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, and we obviously had a bit of a pullback uh, to that moving average. It's still a primary trend. Everything is still in bull trend. Uh, but what is interesting is the selling in something like this, uh, the Uranium Trust has been more pronounced than what we have seen actually on phys uh, physical spot uranium. And uh, the way to, uh, to track that, I have on page 11 uh, a chart showing the uh, spot uranium price in orange versus the uh, net asset value of the uranium in, in the trust. And what you can see is that the closed-end trust is now trading at 11% uh, discount 
uh, to that of spot uranium. So it very well could be uh, that this uh, Sprott Physical Trust simply has uh, spurred some profit taking on some traders that made some good money and uh, is simply quite oversold and could very easily mean revert back to towards its net asset value. One way or another, it's a, a, a market that uh, is still in primary bull trend. Uh, all bull trends have secondary corrective patterns. And so we're clearly in some sort of a pause, but there's no reason not to believe that this won't be bought on dip. Finally, I wanted to touch on the 10-year Treasury yield. What we have uh, seen is obviously the uh, reacceleration of some of the inflation spur yields higher and uh, create some nervousness in the bond markets. While we could see a, a, the 10-year Treasury yield uh, work its way up to 450 basis points, I'm still in the camp that the highs that were put in October and November near 500 basis points are very likely going to be a multi-year high. Uh, so uh, to me, as these yields get up here, it will be interesting to see whether that actually creates a bond buying opportunity that uh, going into the second half of the year. Right now, in the short term, the trend is clearly there. Certainly, you highlighted those uh, March inflation numbers, which could be the catalyst that gives uh, these yields one more bump. Um, but uh, other than that, uh, we, you know, we'll just keep a close eye on this trend. It clearly is still in the favor of uh, bonds consolidating and yields going a little bit higher. Folks, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading. The details are on the last pages of the slide deck, or just go to bigpicturetrading.com. Patrick, tell them what they can expect to find in this week's Research Roundup. Well, in this week's Research Roundup, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview and the chart book that we just discussed here in the post game, including a number of links to articles that we found interesting. So you're going to find this and so much more in this week's Research Roundup. Well, that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make this program even better. For those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend, that is Eric spelled with a K, and follow Patrick at Patrick Ceresna. On behalf of Eric Townsend, Patrick Ceresna, and myself, thanks for listening, and see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly Research Roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. 
Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.